What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Artist of Data Science. Today, we've got a conversations episode where we get to hear from people who are doing interesting work, pursuing their dreams, and adding value to the world. We're going to get inside their heads, see what makes them tick, and walk away with a new perspective that's going to help us in our journeys. These episodes are pretty much unstructured, uh, less, way less structured than what you are used to hearing on the show, raw, unedited, unproduced. Thank you for tuning in, and I'd love to hear what you guys think about this episode. Shoot me an email at theartistofdatascience at gmail.com with your thoughts. Our guest today started his career as a broker on Wall Street, spending the last nine years at BlackRock, where he enjoyed the challenges of performing on a highly competitive and talented sales teams. He's recently reinvented himself and is on a mission to serve and encourage people to proactively look for the connections between industries, technologies, histories, and psychologies. Why? Because these insights and secrets can lead to the personal and professional growth that will enhance life's journey. He's the co-host of the Rising Laterally podcast, a wildly insightful show where he's learning about starting a business from scratch and speaking to authors with interesting books so you can learn something fascinating. So please help me welcoming our guest today, a man who enjoys recognizing patterns, consistently iterating, understanding psychology, and improving, my good friend, Arjun Suchdev. Arjun, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to come on the show, man. I appreciate having you here. I appreciate it, Harpreet. Thanks for having me on. And um, it's great. It's actually an honor because... I know the caliber of guests that you've had. So just to be able to share this vir virtual space with you, it's an honor. So I'm glad to be here. Shit, man. Those guys don't mean nothing unless, you know, it, it's, 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 it's more fun talking to a, a, a friend of mine. I think you've become uh, pretty much one of my only few friends that I have uh, over the last year or so. So it's far more of an honor for me to have you on the show, man. I appreciate you being here and, uh, you know, full disclosure for everyone, this is our second take at this interview. We recorded this the first time around months and months ago. So typically when people are listening to my show, like the episodes you're hearing are have been recorded sometimes six, seven months in the past. Uh, I listened back to that first interview that we did and I was like, holy shit, man, I sound like a fucking asshole. Um, so, so I uh, I decided to scrap that one. Who knows? And maybe at some point in the future, if people like what we're talking about here i might re-release that um, <laughs> but but this one yeah and who knows what i said either dude so <laughs> it's 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 all good and uh, yeah i mean you're you're much more of a uh, composed gentleman than than i was but i mean since then you and i've been talking more been connecting more um so i definitely feel like you know know each other a little bit better and it might make for an even better episode this time around uh so this is it recorded like a week two weeks before I'm actually going to be releasing this. So this is like the freshest interview that people on the podcast are going to be hearing, uh, unless you're listening to this 20 years in the future. Well, <laughs> then it's gone stale. Hopefully the ideas that we talk about are eternal though. Um, but yeah, man, before we get into questions about what you're up to, what the podcast you got is all about, let's learn a little bit more about you. Talk to us a bit about where you grew up and what it was like there. Well, I was born in New York City, um, but I was raised in New Jersey, a small town. Uh, it was the suburbs. Um, we're about an hour away from New York City. Uh, my parents are Indian immigrants, and that's really where I got my hustler spirit from. But like looking back on it, like it was one of those towns where everything was there, but it felt boring. But it's like now I can look back and say how lucky I am to like live in that environment and grow up in that environment. I think it's an extreme luxury that I had. Um, but yeah, I mean, they're the ones who instilled the, the hustler spirit in me. And I ended up staying in New Jersey until 2013 when I finally packed up a couple of suitcases and took a one-way flight to San Francisco. Uh, and I've been in California ever since. And now I live in San Diego. So, uh, pretty humble beginnings, um, nothing too crazy, but, um, you know, just a standard immigrant lifestyle. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, exactly. To me, cause it's the same thing for me with, with my family, my parents, I'm curious though, man, like when I grew up, you know, being a child of immigrants, also growing alongside 
people of Indian origin who had just recently moved to the States. Did you ever find yourself kind of in this weird position where you might not be accepted by the people who are just coming from India because you're not Indian enough. And then you're not accepted by the people who are just not Indian, but born here because like, who is this guy? Right. Like, yeah. Right. Did that, did you ever feel like that? Oh yeah. And it's like, Growing up in a town like that, where when I was there, you know, like Indian people started coming in, but by the time I was in high school, I mean, it was like half Indian. So I I, I could tell you that um, just my name alone, like separated me. So when I was young, I kind of got that sense that I'm unique simply because my name isn't a Mike or a Steve or something like that. On the other hand, with like the true Indian people coming over from India, like I had a difficult time connecting with them. And so I didn't really get along with like Indian people all the time. Um, I felt like there was more, more, more drama there. So I ended up just being me and pretty Americanized. Um, I mean, like I married a, a half Italian, half Irish woman. So that, that explains some stuff there. So, yeah, but I mean, early on, it's like, you kind of know you're different just based on your name. And then you realize that like, you're not going to relate to somebody who actually is an immigrant who came up in a completely different lifestyle and like their education system is different too is, you know, back then was more like just based on memorization. Um, So yeah, there were differences. It's almost like a third culture that we have, right? Like we're like a mix of two different cultures implanted into a culture, have to create our own type of of culture. Speaking of names. Yeah, because you want to like, you want to carry some of the culture that you have because that is truly unique to me, that's the spice, right? That's the masala right there. Like, yeah. you don't want to be a boring person. Like, I don't want to be like the hot dog. I want to be the garam masala or something <laughs> like that, right? So you have to balance the culture. And then at the same time, it's like, how do you make sure you don't lose it, right? And so like my parents would take me and my brother and try to get me us to like speak Hindi, like go to Hindi classes, which was great, right? That's a noble thing on their part to have us adopt the culture. But then it's like, when you start speaking Hindi at home, it becomes like a, a, a big deal. It's like, oh my God, he's speaking Hindi. Mm-hmm. So it's like, okay, if that's going to be the reaction, I'm just going to answer in English. <laughs> so that's basically it. Yeah, no, it's like that. I mean, I still have some of that happening with like my wife. Her uncle is like die hard all about Punjabi culture and Punjabi this. And he gets on me because I don't speak enough Punjabi. And I'm like, well, you don't speak enough English, man. So you've been here 40 years and you're still talking like that. Uh, exactly. But speaking speaking of, of names, uh, so so your name, Arjun, right? It's got a, a pretty deep connection with it. Are you familiar with that? Kind of like that, the, you know, the from the Bhagavad Gita, the, the story mm-hmm. of Arjun. Yep, yep. And um, just the bravery behind it. I, I, I mean, I don't know what your question is going to be, but I just feel like I take a lot of pride in my name. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's just the, just the story of that guy, like how he had like the the dilemma he was dealing with, right? He's got his- With his brother. Yeah, right. All this family and be like, 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 killing you guys can't be the right answer, right? It can't just, yeah, it, it, it's uh, interesting. interesting. I mean, if you know it, if you want to recount it for the audience, definitely go for it, man. I don't know it the way yeah. I should know it. The only yeah. thing I know from it is around the idea that this guy was in a battle. He confronted some issues with his brother and his family. And the 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 meaning I get from it is just that he was a warrior. So, I mean, for me, that's how, it, how I've implemented in my life is just be a warrior. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously I could brush up on my yeah. uh, Indian history. Talk about that, man. Being a warrior. I mean, you, you being a warrior is it's for real because you left a really good job right at the essentially beginning of the before the pandemic started before the world went crazy right <laughs> this job and set out on your own path saying that you can start doing stuff your own way man talk to us a little bit about that yeah i mean i had spent 10 years in sales nine of them were at the same company and like i never had a real break in my life and it was just a constant grind And so I ended up getting married in November of 2019. We ended up going on our honeymoon, which turned out to be like one of the last few things you could do before the world shut down. But it was on that honeymoon when I realized how much people in other parts of the world that are living on like 
$3 a day or less are so joyful. And I noticed how this community, um, they didn't judge what another person was doing to make a living. And that really struck home considering, again, I was just in this bubble and in this grind, never was able to pause the, or, you know, pump the brakes. And so I came back and in Q1, literally like the week before it, it all turned, I made a decision to leave. And at the same time, um, you know, we were moving to San Diego for my wife's career. So I thought it was a great time to, uh, you know, leave there and figure out a new life. I had no idea that COVID was going to happen Th to the extent it happened. Obviously no one did, but looking back, I mean, the last year to, you know, 15 months have been incredible because it was that break that I needed to spend time with her, spend time with the people that I actually wanted to spend time with. Uh, it was a break to get to know myself, like the deep down dirty stuff. Um, some of it's been really painful, and then it gave me the opportunity to um, start something from scratch with Rising Laterally. So, you know, we've had a run here of 46 weeks of having episodes. We do one a week. I've had the chance to speak with people from all over the world, read their books, gain insights, and um, try to share it with people. And then ultimately bring it into my own life. You know, right? The things that I'm learning through these books and in these conversations are helping me be more empathetic. So for example, recently we had a conversation about what happens when brains dream. And not only is the science fascinating, but when you realize that there's billions of dreams taking place every night, number one, that's something you can connect on. Um, it just makes it like a conversation where our ability to be able to study our own brain is truly unique to humans. So that connects us on another level. And uh, again, it's taking place with all of us. So if I'm going to sit and try to become more empathetic, it's examples like this. It's like, I know we all dream, you know, after we're done talking about how quarantine was, it's like, I want to get to know how your dreams were recently. I want to get to know you on that type of level. So it's been uh, pretty profound in that, in that sense of just the last year and a half has been um, understanding who I am, starting a business from scratch, getting through the mental hurdles and, um, trying to reshape life on the same token of you know, how crazy it is that we're able to study our own brains and think about our own brains you mentioned like getting to know yourself studying yourself getting deep down like in, into the dark stuff like what, what was what's the process like for that right because that's something that i've been trying to do and i mean it's hard and like I, it, it's difficult it's uncomfortable yeah. what's your process been like for that I've just been trying to get as many gut checks as possible. And so the gut check comes from myself, but also recently I've started to reach out to people and just straight up ask them like, okay, I know that in the past, in certain situations, I've acted like X, Y, Z, right? A lot of it has to come down to any external situation, what goes, what's going on internally and whether or not you're going to react to it or not. And if you are going to react to it, are you going to be miserable about it? Or are you going to be happy about it? Right? So these are kind of the algorithms that are taking place in my mind. But I've just taken that bold step of started to ask people like, okay, what is it I do that bothers you? Um, you know, what would you have rather seen me do in this type of situation? Like, how do you act in these situations? And just having these really tough gut check conversations with people um, just kind of opens up your own vulnerability and opens up the own mirror, your own mirror on yourself. Um, but yeah, it's just that plus also reading some books, which like kind of get, got this whole thing started. But once you realize like the books are not going to give you the real answers, like you got to find yourself. Um, yeah, I've just been also journaling. Uh, I was doing that a little bit throughout the, the beginning half of quarantine where I just getting my thoughts down every day. Um, and especially what I was grateful for. And that kind of like helps set the tone for the rest of the day where really no matter what's going on externally, you can find three things inside of you that are really good. And then if you just think about that, then there's a better chance that your reaction to an outcome is going to be positive. Yeah, what about man. you though? I mean, I know you said you're working on it, but like, wh where are you in the process? Man, I mean, I've been reading so many books for so long and just, hoping that whatever answer it is that I'm looking for is in one of these pages. And 
<laughs> I'm quickly realizing that that's not the case. Like, like these books got ideas and they're interesting and they're cool, but like none of them have the solution to my problem because none of these people know me. They're not writing for me, right? Right. Most people are writing books for themselves or talking about things that worked for them. And that's cool. Like, you just don't take that as if it's a prescription or a pill that's going to make you better. Just take take little ideas from people and implement it in your own process. So for me, I mean, I, I spent a good part of earlier this year, about 30 days or so, I would sit for about an hour straight and just do nothing. Just sit there and just let let my thoughts happen. Just go back and and think about things from the past and just kind of bury what needs to be buried in, in, in a good way put to rest and then think about how I can move forward, propel myself forward. Uh, journaling has been helpful just because like it's a mess in here and I'm pointing to my head for people listening uh, on the podcast. Yeah. It is. It's a mess in here. It's tangled. It's this tangled, messy web. And I find that uh, by writing and, and by journaling, it's interesting because earlier in my journal today, I was writing about writing. <laughs> I was writing about how <laughs> writing helps me kind of untangle this web and untangle the the knots in my mind just to be more still, more tranquil. Um, it's not easy. It's hard. Um, I don't know if that answered your question or not. but Yeah. Well, you mentioned untangled or it's all tangled in the mind. I can tell you the one thing that's helped me is running. Like I've never been an active runner or an avid runner, but obviously with quarantine, you couldn't go to a gym. So I just started running. And um, what I'm realizing is that it's a great way to just release so many thoughts because, you, you know, in, in many cases, uh, you end up just thinking about like taking the next, next step and like taking the next step to the best of your ability. Like, that's the mindset when you're running and that just creates that, you know, presence. And then if you can just take that and apply it to your everyday life, if you could just do everything to the best of your ability, then you're probably only going to be thinking about that thing. It's just a better way, in my opinion, of just filtering through some of the noise. I like that a lot. And when you're out there running, like, are you listening to music? Are you listening to anything? Or is it just you, thoughts on the ground? I wish it was just me and my thoughts on the ground. But uh, your boy is uh, addicted to the Peloton app because, you know, they got that meter running of how many times you're using it and how many miles you're racking up. So... Uh, I listen to the Peloton instructors and and the music they have. Yeah. I mean, but still that's, that's good because it's, it's kind of like a coach encouraging you. Like I go on walks a lot. I walk a lot, but every time I'm on a walk, it's usually I'm listening to an audiobook while I'm walking, mm. which I feel like kind of defeats the purpose. There's been some days where I've walked with, without the audiobook playing in my head and I just get ideas like great, yeah. great ideas. And, um, it's because I think I give it, give my mind space to to have that while I'm on these walks. I mean, you know, my interview schedule is crazy with the podcast. Like I interview a lot of authors and I have to read so many books a week. I have to listen to so many audiobooks a week. And it's, it's so much, man. It's like so much goes in and I don't give myself the, the time or the space to, to synthesize it, to make it mine to absorb it right and yeah so even though yeah i've got a vanity metric of however many hundred I've probably read about 40 50 books already this year which is a complete vanity metric because like i haven't i haven't really I don't feel like i've learned 40 or 50 books worth of shit you know what i mean yeah because uh, it's hard to integrate it it's yeah. hard to actually act it yeah. um or, or be it and i can it's you know um with with an audio book, it feels like it's just a podcast. And for me, I struggle with it because I can't really pay attention. Mm -hmm. You know, one of my favorite things to do is actually just read. It's a great way to get away from your phone and um, just, you know, untangle some of the thoughts, even though you're putting in new thoughts. And then also like, th there's something to be said about taking a break from reading and other people's ideas. Like you were getting to it. It's like, you just have to have the, the ability to give yourself that space. So it really comes down to sleep, man. Like yeah. this is why you need eight hours of sleep, dude, because yeah. like for every hour that you're awake, let's say you're awake for 16 hours for every hour you're awake, your brain needs two to actually integrate what it learned from the day. And in that process, it's figuring out which memories it really wants to hardwire and which ones it doesn't. So sleep is super important. Yeah, man. Uh, for the longest time, 
like months and months and months on end, probably almost a year straight. I was only getting like six hours of sleep mm -hmm. and it, things just started crumbling for me in like February, like just the headaches all day, irritable, burnt out. Uh, and since then I just been just sleep. I just been prioritizing sleep. Like I don't wake up at 4 a.m. Like I used to anymore. Nowadays it's more like 5, 30, 6. Um, but that sleep is important, man. That's, that's for sure. Yeah. But you know, something, oh, sorry. Yeah. No, no, go for it. Go for it. No, I was going to say something that uh, you brought up today on, on your LinkedIn profile was around game theory. Yeah. Like you talked about that, right. And you mentioned, or you, you put up a quote there about like, you know, everyone's playing a game basically. And the first thing you have to do is figure out where the value lies for the person that you're talking to or interacting with. And when I read that, I just got to say, like, it reminded me of something that I think is worth sharing, which is a couple things. Like, if you are currently in a situation where you're trying to elevate your career, this is something I learned uh, from one of my um, conversations recently. If you're really thinking about everything as a game and you think about that interview as a game, before they allow you to start talking about yourself and you know you start going on this poetic story that really doesn't answer any of their needs, the thing that I learned is you have to ask them like, hey, I really appreciate being here. It means so much. You know, I'm looking forward to the role and the opportunity. But before we begin, what is it about my resume or about me that made you want me to come in? Right. And so like even that, I just feel like is a shift in how people can think about interviews in the future. So I wanted to bring that up because you mentioned game theory on your on your LinkedIn and it just triggered that thought. I like that a lot. And I think that's a great piece of advice that people should implement at the start of any interview they have, because you're forcing them to think positively about you from the start. It's like a psychological hack almost. Right. Yep. There's you're you're just telling tell me all the reasons why i'm awesome and why you brought me here today but right. beyond that it's beyond that it's giving you like the answers to the test right because right. they're gonna they maybe they say they are looking for someone to fill a particular role on the team that wasn't in the job description like word for word and if you just listen to that person talk about uh why they brought you in and you start to use that language and the answers back it's like you got the answers to the test yeah so uh random spinoff now let's talk about you mentioned gratitude i was going to ask you those three things that you're grateful for for today because uh like i mean i got i got the six minute journal and part of the six minute journal every day is like writing down three things you're grateful for and i don't know if i don't think about it hard enough or or whatever but i mean do, i mean if you're grateful you're grateful for something right my, my three <laughs> things i was grateful for today was just waking up the delicious coffee i'm drinking and <laughs> Being able to purchase groceries and have food on demand. Yeah, dude, honestly, I basically write the same things every day. It's like my wife, my dog, and the ability to actually think. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. I'm grateful that I have this. It feels like a superpower. Like, we have the ability to think, and I just think sometimes it's taken for granted. Tell me about that. How, how do you feel like it's taken for granted sometimes? Because we've evolved like millions of years, like, you know, 7 million years ago or something like that, we came from chimps and orangutans. And, you know, that took a lot of work for evolution to get us to this peak point that we think we're at. And then for us to say the, the silly things that we say or react poorly to situations, it reminds me of like, we take our thinking for granted, because if we were truly, truly, truly evolved and we really were human in every situation like we would be able to get over the things that are the human condition that hold us back like that's where the real wisdom is and that's what i'm trying to strive for so i'm constantly reminded about how dumb i am and how little i know but that's also one of the most fun parts of every single day <laughs> oh do absolutely man I, I fucking love i love feeling dumb i love feeling stupid uh, I never <laughs> want to feel like I know it all uh, because if you ever feel like you know it all, dude, you're on a slippery slope because you, you've got it fucking wrong if you think you know it all. Uh, yeah. It's it's interesting because so one of the things 
uh, so like I mentioned, interview a bunch of authors and I'm grateful for every author I interview, grateful for all the books they send my way, grateful for reading all the books. But sometimes it becomes a chore and it becomes a burden for me to read these books because, I mean, yeah, I want to read the books, but I have to read the books. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, re- you know, I'm, I'm dedicating this summer just to reading books that, that I truly want to read with no strings attached. Like the authors have been dead for a long time. So I, <laughs> I'm not talking to these guys uh, to podcast interview. But uh, my point was, I was just reading this book, um, started reading this book called How to Solve It. Okay. And it's just all about how to solve problems and uh, just going through some of these books and there, you know, there's some simple stuff in here, like, you know, simple geometry and simple, you know, algebra type of stuff. And you're taught one way to do it in school, but this guy's showing you like four or five different ways to solve the same problem. And that's when you realize like, it's all about making those different connections. Right. Oh yeah. And yeah. Uh, so that's something you've been you doing. Could think, yeah, yeah, you could think linearly and always think that there's going to be one answer to everything, or you can think across verticals and start to look for intersections and philosophies or technologies or histories. Because again, like that's where your ignorance is going to lie. You're going to make, holy shit, I didn't know any of this. And then from that is where your growth comes from. Yeah, um, yeah you mentioned how to solve it as a book. Um there was a professor. I don't know if you ever ended up listening to that Lex Friedman and um, yeah. Professor Lowe episode. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that yeah. guy is a genius. The way yeah. he teaches and helps people just think about a problem, not necessarily like have a formula for it. It's like we're gonna come to an answer together. Yeah, I would. And he has he, YouTube videos where he does live math and, problems. And he's just like, okay, if I can't get it, oh, yeah, it looks like it's hard. I can't, I can't do it. He makes it okay to be a fucking genius ass mathematician and not know how to do something. Uh, yeah. And his style of exams was like, shit, dude, I would hate to be a student in his class. Cause he was like, yeah, I'll give students, uh, I'll give students exams, all my previous exams, but it's exams I give them are not related to the previous exams or even related to anything I taught them in class. Uh, it's just testing their ability to connect ideas and push forward with, with something, which I thought was interesting, but I guess there's a reason I didn't go to Ivy league. Uh, cause I yeah. <laughs> We're not inventors. <laughs> yeah. It's actually, it's actually a very, very interesting point you just made. I'm going to pull up a quote that I was reading in the book today. Cause it was all about invention. Uh, this quote, and I'm going to pull it up here and it says mathematics is interesting in so far as it occupies our reasoning and inventive powers. But there is nothing to learn about reasoning and invention if the motive and purpose of the most conspicuous step remain incomprehensible. I just thought that was a fucking magnificent quote from this, how to solve it. But yeah, it's all about inventiveness, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it talks to us about rising laterally, right? So, uh, How's this journey been for you? I mean, because the last time we spoke, man, it was months and months and months ago. So you might have only had like f- probably five or six episodes out. Yeah. We talked last Super time. early. Yeah. yeah. Very early in the process there. Yeah. Um, and because of you, I mean, we got inspired by you in terms of being able to bring on authors. I mean, like, no lie, you've been an expander to us, uh, an inspiration and someone that we've been following closely. So, um, yeah, I mean, with Rising Laterally, we basically have boiled it down to if you're going to come by uh, our YouTube channel or find us on Spotify or Apple, you're doing it because you want to learn something fascinating. You're not going to go there for like a sports talk. You're not going to go there for two people just talking about the day. We want to actually have something where you can take something like, for example, like when brains dream, like half that is so people know the science, which is incredible. But the other half is to give people enough ammo to feel like they can create a connection with people. So basically let's help people take something and apply it to their everyday life. And in that process, do it myself. So, right. That's the other thing. It's like rising laterally has just taught me about like, for example, like the weakness, like some, some things that used to be weaknesses over the last 10 years are now turning into strengths. And I keep going back to the empathy thing because that's a word that's tossed around so much. Like everyone is talking about being empathetic, be more kind, be more compassionate, but not a lot of people are talking about how to do it. And I think the how to comes from just experience. It comes from living. 
Like it comes from maturity. It comes from going through situations. If you're really going to be empathetic, you have to be able to feel pain. You have to actually be able to put yourself in someone's shoes. And really one of the only ways to do that is by living life and really going through situations, um, but also challenging yourself. So recently, you know, I got, we were lucky to be able to buy a home. So again, super grateful for that, but the challenge was renovating it. And instead of hiring somebody, we chose to do it ourselves, right? So we chose to get down and dirty, learn the skills, learn it through YouTube basically. And uh, now it's like, I can relate to somebody who's going through a home project in a much more deeper and authentic way. And it's basically just like, it's the, the whole rising laterally experience has been about experimenting. It's been about uh, doing things and it's been about just, you know, finding growth. It's been incredible. And so your co-host for the show, uh, Jay, uh, t- talk to me about your guys' history. How long have you guys known each other? How, how'd you guys come together and think like, let's start a podcast? Yeah. Jay and I have been uh, friends for like seven years now. Um, We actually met at BlackRock and uh, we always used to like have great conversations during lunch or happy hours. And they would basically be like mini episodes of a podcast. Um, And then what happened was in, you know, during quarantine, we both looked at each other and we're like, this is going to be the only time where we have the time to do this. So we just invested in a couple of mics and did it. And he's been great in terms of being part of the iterative process, helping bring on guests. He does uh, the editing for us. Um, And that's the other thing, like, I mean, about Rising Laterally, it's not about us. I mean, every guest that we've had has had, you know, when you think about somebody who wrote a book, they've put like 10 years of research into that. So the biggest takeaway from me is if I'm going to go speak or go talk to somebody or really bring something to a meeting like i want to back it with research and facts and like know what i'm talking about because there are people in this world that have dedicated their entire lives for this one project so it really just put everything in perspective yeah the jim quick i think has this this awesome quote about books it's by reading a book you can download decades in days i just saw that compressed information into into one book yeah so what's that journey been like, man? Because it's it's a bit of an entrepreneurial journey for you, right? So how's that how's that been? What's the, some of the struggles you've been facing? Like, you know, what's what's the self talk been like for you over the last year? Oof, uh, there's been some really really dark times. I'm not gonna lie, because when you go from a cush corporate situation to one where you're you're not in that anymore, and you realize like just because I'm on this mission. Now, all of a sudden, everyone around me is on this mission too. Like there's this burden that comes along with making this successful, right? Um, So for me, I mean, some of the challenges have just been the mental aspect where, you know, you put out a good piece of content, it gets no love, right? Even taking a step back, sometimes, you know, um, it hurt in the beginning when you felt like you had all these relationships that you had built from your previous career and five months after leaving, it's like you never existed, right? And so it's like, holy smokes, nobody, you know, these people that I thought I had built relationships with, all of a sudden, like, they don't even want to hit play on any of these episodes. And then you realize, you know what, I'm actually going to get more support from people I don't know. So once that shifted in my mind, I started to realize that, okay, everyone is at their own journey in life. For me to think that just because I started a podcast, all of a sudden people are going to listen, is naive right so again it was just more of those types of thoughts and now i just i kind of care like i couldn't care less to be honest because it's like they're living their journey i'm living my journey and it's all good that's that that's just our life so it's been those kinds of mindset shifts and at the end of the day it comes down to something that you and i have talked about which is like trying to think big and trying to do something bold here um at the end of the day like a lot of people live 45 or 55 years just with their dreams sucked out of them. They never took the chance. And, you know, even if this doesn't get to the scale that you're at, um, I learned something and I can like package that into my story. So it's, it's everything you can think about as it relates to the entrepreneurial story has happened. 
and there's things that I probably don't even know are going to happen and I'm going to have to confront them. That's the biggest thing is just confronting challenges that you've never faced before and confronting mindsets that you've never had to face before and then fixing the algorithm in your head to get through it. It's the best way to live life, right? Confronting those new challenges, facing them, finding ways to, to move past them. Uh, otherwise, you're just getting older, right? Yeah. <laughs> you're just doing the same shit day in, day out, getting older. Um, and to that point, yeah. I mean, that's why iterations matter so much, right? So it's like we have tried so many different things, you know, whether it's releasing three clips a day or just one post a week. Um, or just leaving it just one episode a week and then no noise. Like we're just trying to figure out like, how to play each platform. We're trying to figure out like, what is it that people gravitate towards? And it's taken 46 weeks to this point. And what we've realized is that people come to us for facts. If we don't have something that's fact-based, we notice that there's less engagement. So we've made the shift where everything we do or everything we present it starts with some fact or is backed by some fact. And I think that's really been a key differentiator for some of the growth recently relative to some of the stagnation that had occurred in the middle. So I like that approach, right? Like that experimentation approach, being a scientist, that is uh, definitely what I'm, what I'm all about. Uh, how do you decide which way to move? Let's say you, you're presented with, a fork in the road, you've got some options ahead of you. Um, how do you decide which option to take, which one to test out? Or do you just look at it as, you know, this is a long term game that I'm playing. So if I don't get to try out, like if I got option A, B, C, D in front of me, I'll try out option A, B, and then maybe later in the future, try out C, D, or is it option A, B, C, D, just get rid of them? Well, I feel like everything we've tested, we're basically testing for failure, right? We're testing to see what works and what doesn't work. And when it comes to being in front of three or four different choices, some of it is relying on experience. Okay, what worked? Which one of these three has worked? Which one of these three has not? And then it's also seeing what other people are doing. So as much as we want to be unique, you also have to see trends, right? So that's why all of a sudden, you know, polls are all of a sudden something that a lot of people on LinkedIn are using. So it's like, okay, let's try to incorporate some polls into our posts. So it's just a matter of being a student of the market, whatever market it is, whether it's podcasting, whether for me it was asset management or, you know, for you data science, just being a student of the game um, helps provide a little bit more clarity to those, you know, three choices that you're faced with. Yeah. What about you? beginner's mind huh dude like i suck at it like you know i mean i'll experiment on scientific experiments that i got at work or whatever like you know my little data science experiments but i'd suck at social media stuff like like i don't really i just post content and i don't necessarily focus on what the people want i'm very selfish about the way i create content and post content right because i will interview people based on whatever I feel like I'm kind of going through. So you'll see a string of episodes come out all based around one theme, but unofficially mm -hmm. around one theme, right? And then I'll explore questions based on things that I'm going through or like I've read through their book and I'm like, okay, well, I don't understand this shit. Let me, let me ask you about it. You wrote about it. So hopefully you can explain it to me because I did not get it when I read your book. Um, mm. So I don't necessarily look for what the audience wants when I am creating my podcast. Uh, it's solely just... I mean, I say solely just for me, but I have never listened back to one of my episodes. Um, even now, like my editing is, uh, I barely edit the episodes anymore. I used to be, I remember I was telling you, I like, used to be super rigorous with the way I edit them. And now I'm just like, let it be, right? Because I was scared of uh, sounding stupid or whatever. Now I'm like, I don't care if I sound stupid. That's great. I want to sound stupid. Um, <laughs> so, so I don't, don't necessarily experiment w across social media platforms the way that most people say that it should be done even with like my linkedin content like it's a mix of you know, philosophy data science facts and sometimes me sounding like an asshole but it's, it's weird man because like the shit that is me 
kind of like I read back, read it back, and I'm like, oh, I sound like a fucking asshole on this post. I'm not even writing this post for me. This post is for the people. Yeah. I sound like a dick. The tone and everything I'm talking about, that shit blows up. And it's like, okay, well, that's not actually me. Like I'm reading that back in my head. I'm like, that's not my voice. That's not me. But yet it does well. But then the stuff that's actually me, like more the philosophy yeah. and stuff, it doesn't get any traction. And it's like, all right, well, people don't like the real me, like that asshole ish version of me. I don't, I don't know, man. Uh, so yeah. I'm I in the same boat. I feel you. Yeah. It, What's it like? How do you navigate that? Well, so the way I post, I'm basically talking to my unborn child. So whenever that miracle happens and they're old enough to read and let's say I'm not here anymore, like those messages are for them. I'm basically talking to a younger version of myself. And if people like it, great. If not, great. It's literally, I'm doing it for myself in those posts. And that's kind of help with like not worrying about engagement. But when it comes to like rising laterally specific stuff, obviously you want to see success because like that feels good for the ego. But one thing that you might actually be real, able to relate to is it doesn't matter if your podcast post got engagement. It matters if your podcast was consumed behind the scenes, right? So what Buzzsprout and YouTube are telling you is much more important than what you're getting from an Instagram post or a, a, a LinkedIn post. So that's kind of I've thought about it. Um, I'm also trying to figure out like, you know, every Monday I do a, a podcast peers post because that helps me stay engaged with the industry, like learn it, understand what the trends are when it comes to advertising, because ultimately one day I want to be able to take some of those insights and present them to a sponsor, right? If I know that a mid spot role in other words, an advertisement that takes place in the middle of an episode generates 76% of revenues for a company. And that if it's read by the host, you know, that contributes to over 50% of revenues, then I can take that type of insight as I position rising laterally for a sponsor. So I basically do it for that, man. It's education. And then it's just uh, for my unborn child. <laughs> I like that approach, man. I like that approach. But most of my journaling, it's uh, just letters for my son, essentially. Like, yeah. right. I mean, th there's journaling that I do just for me that I toss out, but then there's journaling that I do that's uh, like I'll pick up a piece of philosophy and it could just be a quote. It's usually just aphorism, right? So I got like a book of that, like I got several books of aphorisms here. Like I got uh, Bruce Lee Striking Thoughts, I've got Heraclitus mm. Fragments, uh, I've got Everything by Aaron Haspel, and uh, I'll, I'll take, you know, like the, and the aphorism is just one sentence, right? And I'll take that one sentence, I'll quote it in the book, uh, in my journal, in this journal, and then I'll just write about it for one page. And just on, on whatever that, that particular quote was, just write about it for one page. And they're essentially letters to my kid. Um, <laughs> yeah, so if, if he ever finds them, that's, uh, that's, that'll be great. Um, but it's, not, it, it, it's, it's interesting creating stuff because I mean you think about it man like uh, there's people that listen to my podcast I've never interacted with them like there's a handful that come to my office hours and I talk to them I see them I know them they have a face they're personified in front of me but then there's people who are consuming my shit like I was like the number one rated podcast in Uganda right oh yeah right like fucking Uganda <laughs> like I don't know anybody from Uganda but people are in Uganda are listening to it they rated me at the like on apple awesome. charts right like this is wild to me um that you get in this, yeah. pos in this position it's not like i'm not like a in a big position or anything like i've got small little podcasts but still affecting people still reaching people i still get messages from people talking about how they're so grateful they found my podcast or whatever and i'm like wow dude that's the most amazing thing ever uh, like yeah like, it is there's people out there like we don't we don't know they're gonna listen to this conversation and maybe somebody's gonna find a hook or find a idea that might inspire them to do something and to me man that's just magical and i think that just makes it all all worth it right i agree with you it's been uh it's incredible um when that feeling does or when that does occur because that feeling of like 
wow, there's people in Africa that are listening to me right now. Um, but it's the internet, right? We have uh, this at our fingertips. And I think one thing I'm gathering from like the last few minutes is like everything we're talking about, even if it's just us talking about doing something big, or even if it's just talking about doing something, it comes down to that there's going to be a spectrum, right? Like there's going to be iterations and there's going to be a spectrum. And that's the whole idea of life, I feel like. And then when you add the element on top of that, that like nobody's normal, like as humans, we're on a spectrum. And then what we're doing is on a spectrum. It gives you that create, like that flexibility to go be creative and actually do something, uh, whether it's big or small, just do something. Because when you're doing something, you're living. Like that, that, that phrase I always end most of my office hours with. Uh, most any public engagement, you know, you've got one life on this planet. Why not try to do something big? Yeah. People are just like, what do you mean by big? Like well, big, big, it's like, you define big for yourself, right? There's a, a, a girl on LinkedIn that uh, she posted something and we was talking about, it was her actual first post and her first post on LinkedIn note to herself or whatever. And I was like, that is something big. That's like, you know, something <laughs> big is big is relative, right? I mean, it, it, it's, there's not a universal notion of bigness, right? Right. Like me sitting here having this really candid conversation with you that's completely unstructured, unlike any other conversation I've done. Even my, even, even my the, the, the previous conversations episodes where I claim they're raw and unedited and unstructured aren't really that raw, unedited, or unstructured. I usually have questions, a few planned in advance, but in this in this case, there's nothing. We have no safety net. Uh, that's something big for me, right? Yeah. Um, a big is completely relative, man. So as long as it's, as long as you feel like it's something big, as long as it's, it's here's your little bubble. And as long as it's like right here, right outside your little yeah. bubble. That's cool, yeah. man. That's big. Do it. Exactly. Because you're breaking your comfort zone there and you're trying something. And, you know, it's like, in terms of this conversation, like I remember we were just texting with each other. What are we going to talk about? And let's like, let's just talk about going, doing some big things. And, you know, for me, that actually is important because I don't necessarily feel like I'm speaking out of line when I talk about these things, because I've actually had a near death experience. You know, when I was 19, I've, I spent a week in the ICU where my brain was bleeding. Like I've had the experience of a doctor tell me how close I was to dying. And that, when I was that young, that gave me that chip on the shoulder of like, I'm just going to be who I am and be bold. And even with that experience, even with that near death experience, I still can find myself like fighting the human condition at times and, you know, being worn down by some of society's like boxes that it creates. So I'm, I think the people who are listening should realize like I'm a work in progress. I'm an awkward person sometimes, but I'm coming from a place of like, I've basically seen a flat line before. And so for me, it's like, everything is big. Everything's fascinating. I love it. Um, and you know, it, the times when I'm not able to control that is the times when I know that I'm not matured yet. Right. So it still gives me that glimpse into like where I could still be mature. What happened at 19, man? What Do you want to share that story with us? Uh, yeah, I mean, at this point, I've kind of gotten over the fear of sharing it. But, uh, you know, I was 19. We were celebrating a birthday, my buddy's birthday. And uh, I didn't eat much that day. And I had one too many shots. And the next thing you know, I wake up in the hospital with my eight friends around me. And I'm hooked up to all these wires. It actually was 24 hours later. So I was actually like out for a day. Um, that I didn't know about. And, uh, you know, the doctors noticed that I had suffered a brain contusion, which is what happens when your brain starts bleeding. Um, and so that became a really serious thing. And I ended up staying in the hospital for a week. Um, I remember like, there was this one particular Wednesday, the Wednesday of that week where apparently what happens when your brain starts to drain blood it, is it goes through your spine and that was like one of the most painful experiences ever. Um, and nurses would come in and be like, well, do you know what your name is today? Like, can you walk around uh, the hall, like some of the basics and thank the universe that I am able to remember everything 
prior to that day and everything since that day. Like it is an incredible miracle that I'm here talking to you. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's basically what happened. I ended up missing an entire semester of school because I hit my head so hard on the street, basically had a couple shots. And what happened was I hit my head on the street and I hit my head so hard that it cracked my skull, my brain started bleeding and I put myself at a high risk of seizures. So I had to miss an entire semester of school. And um, yeah, man, it was uh, one of those experiences where, yes, I'm talking about it from my perspective, but looking at it from my brother's perspective and my parents' perspective and the hell that they went through because I made a decision to go have fun with my friends and it almost cost me my life. Like that is something that's been something that I think about a lot. <laughs> that's crazy, man. Yeah. That's, yeah. Uh, that's insane. I mean, decisions, yeah. decisions are a motherfucker, man. Like uh, you think about it, all you really have in life are your decisions. Like that is the only thing you have actual control over is how you decide, how you make decisions. And I mean, the consequences, you can't control the consequences of your decisions necessarily, but you are the one that has to live with those consequences. Mm -hmm. uh, but decisions, man, like uh, that's becoming more and more clear to me. Um, Cause I look back on a life of some bad decisions. Uh, decisions are all you have, man. Um, I mean, yeah, going back to the original point that like, I think we kickstarted this with is like the decision of how you're going to react to an external event, event. Yeah. And yeah. you're going against your monkey brain. Like the algorithm that I'm trying to program my brain now is first have no reaction. That's then right. from that no reaction comes your reaction. Like, dude, that's rewiring like millions of years of evolution and trying to live a life like that so but if you can think like this and think about it like an algorithm then at least it, at least it gives you something to strive for sounds like you become a, a stoic uh since we last spoke <laughs> honestly it's just the experience of the podcast man yeah like, yeah yeah because you have no choice you have to like some you have to then li live it you can't just talk it yeah 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 no, straight up, man. It and it's hard to 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 live it. I mean, I I get people coming to to my office, start asking me questions and shit, and it's like, dude, like I don't really know the answer to this. Like, you know, I know I talk about it, but I don't know the actual answer for you. I can't really help you. Uh, most I can do is say something that might inspire you, and you take it and run with it, and hopefully that that helps you. Um, but it's hard to live it, man. It's hard to live your philosophy. I get yeah. it. I, like I'm finding that more and more uh, as I, as I progress along this journey. Yeah. Same. How do you do with goals, like goal setting? Yeah. Um, that's a tough one, man. Like, I mean, yeah, I've got goals, but do I write them down and do I actually like pursue them? How do I go about pursuing them? Right. So for me, it's, it's just more about the process of the pursuit of goals and making sure that what I'm doing to get to the goal, like, I don't really, like I can set a goal. That's cool. Whether I achieve the goal or not, I don't really care about the achievement of the goal. I care about the steps I take to get there. Yeah. So I care more about do, did, did I set myself up for success on the pursuit of achieving this goal? Right. And if I don't, is it be, if I don't achieve the goal, is it because I was lazy and didn't plan my route well enough? Or was it because, yeah, I took the right steps and I did everything that I thought was going to get me there. But in the end, I just did not accomplish it for whatever reason. Right. Yeah. The actual achievement of the goal I can have an influence over based on some of my actions, but there's only so much I can actually control. Yeah. Right? That, the, the universe itself is highly multivariate. And for me to think that just because I take some action that it will have some result, it's a very really naive thought process. Um, it's not like there's a test that, I mean, even if, you, even if you're in school, you could study all you want and then go take a test, but you can't control what shows up on that test. You can right. control your process for preparing for that exam. 
Um, so yeah, I've got goals. Do I really care about them? No, I care more about the, the steps I take to get there. If that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Um, and back to the testing, it's like the question is the question and I, I get, and I won't get upset. That's the mantra when you're taking a test. And as it relates to like the goals, I mean, you could set a goal and accomplish it and do the wrong things to accomplish it. Like you could cheat your way to a goal. And based off what you said, I agree. I'd rather just go through the right process, a quote unquote, right process, or go through the process and figure it out and learn about myself. And if I achieve the goal, fantastic. If I didn't, also fantastic, because at least I can look at myself in the mirror at night, right? I didn't just accomplish a goal to accomplish a goal. I didn't cheat my way there. Um, I didn't do the wrong things. I like really tried to do a process around this. And if that process got me the gold, great, great. If it didn't, it's, I still learned something from it. Yeah. That's the exact right mindset to have. I think and I was going to make a point here about, um, I forgot what the fucking point was, but <laughs> like it must not have been that important. Uh, but yeah, man, I mean, I don't think I've actually ever been like tested. You know what I mean? Like, hmm. yeah, I've got goals. They've all been vanity goals, right? But I don't think they've ever had like a the actual test that is forcing me to put everything I've learned into practice. And I don't mean like a test, like a, a you know, writing an exam test. I mean like an actual real life situation, skin yeah. in the game, right? Skin in the game, like where my decisions can have detrimental consequences, right? Yeah. And I want to be in those positions. Like I want to find ways for me to have those opportunities. Um, Cause I feel like my life has been far too fucking easy. Right. It's been hard because I've made it hard myself with my poor decisions. Um, and I had the luxury of making poor decisions because I could always rebound from them. But I yep. want those opportunities where I got skin in the game where if shit goes wrong, it, it can go wrong. Right. Like I want those type of opportunities. Does that make yeah. sense? Like, yeah. Like crazy back about. against the wall. Yeah. Back exactly. against the wall mentality. And I mean, it's something I've been thinking about a lot too, um, because in the construct of the era that we're in, there's a lack of equity. Like a lot of people don't have ownership in anything. A lot of, and as a result, I think that they don't, because if you don't have ownership or equity in something, then you also have a tough time holding yourself accountable. And I feel like all that kind of plays itself into some of the things that we see in society. If more people were given equity, if more people were given ownership, if more people had to be accountable, I feel like you would have a much more kinder and empathetic society because there'd be more people that are in the same boat, right? So I feel you on that. I mean, the, the fact that you're even tr putting it out in the universe that you want those type of situations, like you are confronting or you are bringing on like a land of unknown possibilities into your world as opposed to just sitting in the land of comfort. And that I think is something that's commendable. Yeah. I mean, cause I know that I've, I've, I've sweat enough in practice that when it comes time to go to war, I won't bleed that much. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like I've put in the mental work, I've put in the, the, the training and the, the mental discipline that when I'm in that situation, I know that I can act with clarity. I can decide with clarity. Um, and I mean, I, I like what you're saying about accountability and equity and leverage. Cause I know, you know, you know, Naval Ravi Gant, I think you've been yeah. vibing yeah. with him, but he talks about that as well. Right. You know, in order to, I mean, obviously we all want to be wealthy, right? It's not the end all be all, but yeah, we, we want to be, we want to be wealthy, we want to get paid, but you only really get wealthy and get paid if you have leverage, but to get leverage, you need equity right? And people don't just give you equity, right? Uh, people don't just give you capital. They don't just give you labor. They don't just give you assets to manage. You need accountability to get those things, right? And the way you get the accountability is by putting your name and your reputation on the line to get that, right? And 
I want those opportunities, right? The shit has been far too easy for me in my career, right? They, I mean, they might seem hard, but to me, it's just child's play, everything I've done. Yeah. There's harder challenges out there that if given the opportunity, oh man, I know I can crush them. Yeah. No, it's interesting, interesting you say that because like, even for me, um, when I left my corporate job to go into the unknown and I ended up doing, you know, starting this rising laterally, uh, like on paper, it doesn't seem like there's much parallel there. But then when you actually think about like what I was doing for nine years, my clients were all financial advisors, right? So I was consulting them. And in that process, I was dealing with people who were small business owners themselves. Like they created their practice from scratch, right? They had ownership, they had equity and being around that for nine years, you kind of get that glimpse into like what it can be like if you do things the right way. And if you do things consistently and again, just my history and like that near death experience and all that, it's like, I came to a point where I wanted, I wanted that. Like I wanted to own something. I wanted to start something from scratch. I wanted to go through that grind and here we are, right? So like on paper, it's like, oh, you left BlackRock and started a podcast. Doesn't look like it makes much sense. But if you actually think about what I was doing, I was working with small business owners and I wanted to just follow that route myself. I like that, man. I like that. I mean, there's something about skin in the game that is, um, that really makes you rethink a lot of things, right? Uh, so before we're uh, hopped on this call here, I was re-listening to one of your older episodes from almost a year ago. Uh, oh, wow. And, and it was, can you think about time differently? Mm. Uh, and the, the, episode, <laughs> the episode description is you guys are discussing an unconventional way of thinking about time that can, get, that can help you get more out of your journey through life. So you've been... You know, it's been almost a year since you've recorded that episode. Uh, you've been going through a lot this year. Uh, have you thought about time differently? I've thought a lot of, about time differently. And I I want, before we get there though, can I just say one more thing on the whole equity thing yes. and the ownership thing? Yeah. Because when you start to have skin in the game, one thing I'm learning pretty quickly and kind of out of nowhere is the difference between having something valuable and having something extremely valuable. And the difference there is not just like 10x growth. It's like 100x growth. It's like 10,000x growth. If you think about how many different artists there are on Spotify and how few get most of the plays, for example, like just that one example tells you the difference between good and great or valuable and extremely valuable. So again, in this process, one thing I've learned is like, what am I doing that's actually extremely valuable because that then becomes scalable. So just in the context of the equity portion of this conversation, value versus extreme value, I think is something to think about. Um, as it relates to time, well, I don't know if you know this, but there's this thing called an attosecond and an attosecond is one quintillionth of a second. So basically, scientists have basically eliminated time when you think about that. And the way that we were thinking about it is time doesn't exist. It's the event that exists. It's what you did in that window that exists. So that when you look back on your memories, you're not necessarily thinking it was a Tuesday. You're thinking about what you did on that Tuesday. So if you can instead think of time as just being this space that I need to fill events, my, you know, fill with events, memorable events, then you can go on and make sure that what you do with your wife or your dog or your kid is something that creates a memory. So that's basically what it was. It's like if scientists have figured out basically how, you know, the, the time it takes between atoms to go between each other is so small Let's just forget about that. Let's talk about what you're doing to fill your window. What are you doing that's memorable? What do you think, what are you doing that when you reflect back on it, you can say, oh, I was, I went to a baseball game. You're not necessarily saying it was Saturday. You're saying I went to a baseball game. So just that little shift and like fill your life span with as many memorable events as possible. 
And that's a much be better way of thinking about quote unquote, the time you spent here. I like that. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I like that a lot, man. I like that a lot. It makes me wonder how I'm spending my time. <laughs> spending it, uh, sitting in this basement, doing what? Learning, reading, hopefully sharing and growing with other people as well. That's, definitely that's powerful, are. man. That's you powerful. definitely are. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. I bet you'll never be able to tell the other than if you looked on your website about when you recorded the episode, but I bet you can tell me about all of your episodes because they were all events. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. One quintillionth of a second. That's crazy. It kind was, of makes no sense. I was yeah. reading, a, reading this book by Roger Van Eck and it was, uh, a whack on the side of the head. That's the name of the book. And in, oh wow! Yeah, it's a book about creativity, creative thinking. And in that book, he talks about uh, the story about Grace Hopper. And Grace Hopper was, um, I think, she was a physicist or a mathematician or a computer scientist. I think she was a computer scientist. And she had to explain what a nanosecond was to people, mm. right? Because we can't, we can't comprehend like what a nanosecond is, right? The way she talked about it was she took a piece of, of yarn nine centimeters long because that's how far light travels in a nanosecond. Oh, wow. And said, this is a nanosecond. <laughs> yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. That's You're like giving it substance, right? You, you give it substance so people can actually put it into context. Yeah, man. Man, it's uh, we're coming up on the hour here. Let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and start winding stuff down here, man. I feel like we can. Uh, we'll probably make this a three-hour episode, but yeah, <laughs> we don't want to do this to the people. Uh, Dude, this entire thing was an exercise in trusting that the words that are going to come out of my mouth actually make sense. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yours did for sure. I hope some of mine did. Uh, but let's wind it down with my my formal last question before we jump into the random round it's 100 years in the future what do you want to be remembered for uh well the the thing that i'm going to be remembered for i feel like still hasn't happened so i'm looking forward to the future but at the end of the day i just hope that people realize that i tried to keep it real. I tried to actually be engaged. I was passionate enough to have my own opinions that I was here to help people. Um, and that like, I really value uniqueness because you know, think about it. Like we live in a world right now where it's all based on recommendations. Like 80% of Netflix substance is recommended to you. You know, 70% of what you watch on YouTube is recommended to you. So how much of what you're consuming every day is actually your own thought? Like how much of it is your own fingerprint? And the way that machines are learning right now, I just feel like that is going to be less and less. So I just want to be remembered for someone who had his own opinions, brought energy, brought passion, and along the way, hopefully help shift some perspectives. Absolutely love it, man. I think you're definitely, definitely checking all of those boxes. Uh, and shout out to all the data scientists, machine learning engineers out there who are manufacturing your guys' experiences. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, the shirt that you're wearing is like, are you wearing that shirt because you actually wanted to wear that shirt or because it was a targeted ad? Yeah. Stuff like that, you know? Well, interesting thing. I recently just tossed out all my T-shirts and bought nothing but black and white T-shirts just because I just didn't want to wear anything uh i've got like three t-shirts that have screen prints on them and they're just pictures of marcus aurelius uh the, the rest of them are just black and white t-shirts um, i love it you yeah. don't have to think about it yeah yeah it's, there's yeah. literally i literally have like 20 t-shirts that are just stashed away um it's trying to be simple and then you know tossing in the michael jackson uh, red for this yeah um but yeah, no, no, man. I think definitely well on your way to to checking all those boxes. Reminded me of something that Terrence McKenna says. Um, you want to reclaim your mind, right, from the hands of these social engineers who are telling you how to dress, how to 
think, how to act, right? And we end up giving, we end up focusing on, you know, in his speech, he talks about, we're thinking about Michael Jackson or Bill Clinton or somebody else. And in the process of thinking about all those people, we are giving it all away to icons. Mm. Icons that are presented to us by this electronic medium. Yeah. Right. Saying that you want to dress like X, have lips like Y. Right. Uh, and it disempowers us because we're giving it all away to these icons. Yeah. Um, and you have to be the catalyst. You have to be the catalyst to say what's never been said do what's never been done, draw, paint, sing, sculpt, dance, act, what has never been done before. Um, and those are all just Terrence McKenna's words that, uh, that have been implanted into my mind there, uh, but definitely aligns well with what you're saying and what you're doing at, at Rise and Laterally, man. Um, so folks, definitely go and check out his podcast, but we're not done yet here. We're going to go to the random question generator and have a good time with that. All right. Pull this up. Would you rather be stuck on a broken ski lift or a broken elevator? I can actually say that this is the first time this question has come up on the random question uh, generator. I've never seen this question before. Uh, which one would you? Okay, so I've been on a broken elevator. It freaked me out. So I'm going to go with broken ski lift um, for two reasons. Number one, like you're probably looking at something beautiful because you're out there in nature. And number two, it's I've already been on a broken elevator. Yeah, that's a hard one, man. Like I, like I'm, I'm scared of heights, like a motherfucker. Um, so, <laughs> so I, I've been on one of those ski lifts, those gondolas that go up, 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 and I'm just like shitting my pants because they don't have seatbelts on them. You just stuck, and you're just like, oh shit, man. Yeah, I could fall and die any second. But then again, the yeah. same thing could happen in an elevator. You just feel like you are on the ground because your feet are touching something. It's a miracle that there aren't more broken elevators. We all take for granted that if I get onto this little vessel, this little 10 foot cube or rectangle that I'm in and I press eight, I'm going to get to the eighth floor. Like it's something that we take for granted. Yeah. yeah it's interesting. Cause that was, uh, 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 Lex Friedman and, and, uh, yeah. what's that guy's name? A Poe. Oh, is that where it was from? I know it was somewhere from the ethos. Yeah, Professor Low, Potion yeah. Low, I think. Yeah, yeah, they were talking about that as well. <laughs> You're like, yeah, if I press this button, it takes me to the 40th floor. It's crazy. The elevator just. Uh, <laughs> what's your earliest memory? Oh, wow, that's a good one. Um, my earliest memory probably is when we were in Flushing, Queens, um, where I you know, was born and lived for a few years before we moved to, to New Jersey. It was like being able to sit on our balcony from our apartment and be able to watch Mets games live at Shea Stadium, like through the crack in their stadium from our balcony. So it'd be on in the TV. We'd have it in front of us, like looking at the stadium. And it was crazy because you would hear the you know, crack of the bat or like the reaction from the crowd. And then you would see it and experience it on TV. So I remember that. <laughs> That's interesting, man. That's yeah. cool. What was your, who was your favorite teacher and why? Uh, my second grade teacher, Miss Brennan, um, because from ever since being in her class through that fifth grade, I feel like she was the only teacher who would ever like ask me how I was doing. Like, even if I was in third, fourth and fifth grade, she was still like ask me how I was doing. Um, yeah, she was just, uh, for some reason she sticks out because she connected. I like that, man. Uh, my favorite teacher, sixth grade teacher, Martin Fine, who is now the superintendent of the Elk Grove Unified School District where I originally went to school. I remember dropping in on him a couple of times, visiting him throughout the years, but man, I up. Just the guy had a, such a positive impact on me. Uh, growing up like really encouraged me uh, so he's he's had a lasting effect on me so if you ever listen to this martin fine love you man nice if you were a vegetable what vegetable would you be i'm trying to think of a vegetable people like uh, <laughs> <laughs> um 
I will say uh, I'll be um, a carrot because carrots come from the ground, you know, like they got that earthy vibe to it. Um, and you could put carrots in a lot of things. So carrots are versatile as an ingredient. Plus they're obviously healthy. And I don't know anyone I've met who doesn't like carrots. So, I mean, people have carrots when they're smushed as babies. My dog has carrots and I have carrots. So I'm going to go with carrot. It's the only vegetable I've ever like heard of being put in a cake too. So boom. Yeah. It's a good vegetable. What about you? Uh, I mean, I eat a lot of avocados and I'm also shaped like one. So <laughs> avocado. <laughs> what languages do you speak? Um, at this point, it's really English, yeah. but uh, I'm elementary in uh, Italian. I took Italian for a couple semesters in college and I would say I'm intermediate in Hindi, but let's be honest, I'm down to English and um, whatever the aliens are speaking. <laughs> Do you uh do you watch any Bollywood movies or anything like that, or any any of the new stuff coming out of of India? There's there's some some dope shit coming out on like uh, on Netflix and and Amazon Prime that are mm. they're they're not necessarily Bollywood, but they're Indian language, and they're made you know starring Indian people, directed by Indian people. Um, some of them are really mind bending. There's this one that just came out. It's called Ajib Dastan. Uh, okay. Ajib Dastan, which I think it just means weird stories. Um, oh, Ajib, yeah. like weird. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. check this out. This is a this a really really good one. Highly recommend. Okay. That one. Uh, they're just short episodes. Um, check them out, man. And then put on the subtitles, and then you'll you'll notice <laughs> that your your Hindi will start improving. Um, yeah, I speak speak English, and believe it or not, like I speak better Hindi than I do Punjabi. You know, nice. I'm um, Punjabi, yeah. Uh, but then I also speak, you know, Python, SAS, SQL, R. <laughs> all the yeah, code. I think that's to me the one thing. If quote unquote, if there's a regret, it's just I wish I knew computer languages better. And I, you know, that's something that if you ask me, like, okay, what's something that you wish you knew better? It would just be computer languages. Obviously, it's where the future is, and something that. I wish I had better grasp on. So go to pythonprinciples.com. It's free and just start. That's probably the best website to learn the absolute fundamentals and basics of the Python programming language um, from the ground That's up. That's cool. Like you go through here and it'll teach you all the basics. And then from there, everything else is just learning on the job. Mm, yeah. Nice. I love that. Thank you. What's one place you've traveled that you never want to go back to? Yeah, what's one place you travel that you never want to go back to? Uh, that's a tough one. Um, I don't know if I have a good answer to that. Maybe I've been lucky that I've gone to places because even in some of the, you know, one time my brother and I took a, a road trip from New Jersey to Houston. Don't ask why we we're just doing it. <laughs> and uh, along the way, uh, we stopped in like the South Alabama. And I remember this was like 10 years ago. Um, and I just remember like stopping at a restaurant and basically it felt like the restaurant stopped because like two Indian dudes just walked in. So technically I would probably never want to go back there. But even in that, I mean, just to be um, exposed to that, basically like the record coming to a, a scratching halt type of scenario, um, like that was an experience in itself. So I really don't have a good answer uh, for that. But I would say that one restaurant in the South that basically stopped everything it was doing because two brown dudes walked in, <laughs> probably not the place I want to go back. Yeah, I'd say for me it was Pecos, Texas. That place is a fucking dump. <laughs> let's uh, let's let's do a couple other random questions, just not from the generator, but uh, from my brain. What are you currently reading? I am currently reading "Tangled Up in Blue" by Rosa Brooks. This is a story of a tenured professor with a husband who's about to retire and two children, and in order to learn more about the 
issues that cops have. She decided to become a DC police officer herself. And um, so that book is fascinating to me. And um, yeah, before that, I read uh, Future Proof, which is um, by Kevin Ruse. And that's a whole entire book on basically nine buckets, big buckets of how we should be thinking about living in an AI and machine learning world. Um, and before that, I read uh, When Brains Dream by Dr. Antonio Zadra. So those are the last three. Nice, man. You're going to have to introduce me to uh, Dr. Antonio Zadra there. I would love to get a copy of that book and, and speak to him about that because uh, that sounds very, very fascinating to me. Uh, what song do you have on repeat? Um, so I wish I had my phone on me. Uh, I wouldn't say it's necessarily a song because I have so many on repeat, but I will tell you that a DJ that I've been listening to a lot recently uh, is Oliver Heldens. Oliver Heldens uh, has a weekly podcast, Hell Deep Radio. Mm. Um, I would just say I'm on, I'm listening to him on repeat. Nice. Yeah. Hell deep. That's a hell of a hell of a name for a Punjabi kid. <laughs> hell deep. No, 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 but he's not. He's uh yeah, yeah, he's yeah, like from the oh yeah. oh but, but I just say it, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, for me it's mostly just to cure the Don stuff, man. Like that that I just love that that blend of dope beats and philosophy. Uh I think I sent you one recently is that the one with Alan Watts. Uh and there's a couple other ones in there, but recently it's just been the the Take Risk song with uh, Naval Ravikant and Akira the Don. Yeah, uh, that's I love that. Dope. That was a great, great recommendation. So how can people connect with you and where can they find you online? Um, if you want to connect with me, connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, but if you really want to follow along, follow Rising Laterally on Instagram and Twitter and make sure you download us on Spotify and Apple and YouTube. Um, that's really where you're going to get a glimpse into fascinating stuff. You know, if you follow me on LinkedIn, you're going to get a little bit of like what's going on in the podcasting world and you're going to get notes to my unborn baby. So <laughs> your choice. I'll definitely link to all of that right there in the show notes. So you guys can all get in touch with my good friend, Arjun. Arjun, thank you so much for taking time out of schedule to be on the show today, man. Appreciate having you here. Dude, you're the man. I appreciate the invite and I cannot wait to see what you do with this thing, man. You're blowing up and it's been uh, your, your fantastic inspiration. Oh man. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Cool.